in the next two back-to-back -back sessions, we're looking at questions surrounding investing amid uncertainty and the global capital markets, 2020's challenges of the century's biggest public health crisis and the deep economic recession that have challenged the finance community to reimagine market resilience and recovery across increasingly complex global landscape conditions. Joining us, Wendy Norris, Deputy Chief Investment Officer, Private Markets of Future Fund, who will moderate a panel of thought leaders to give us more insights on that. Uh, joining uh, will be Hazem Bagem Surm, the Co Chief Executive Officer of InvestCorp, GIC Group Chief Investment Officer, Dr. Jeffrey Jane Subahiki, and Su Yi Kim, Senior Managing Director head of Asia-Pacific of CPP Investments. Welcome to our panel entitled Playing the Long Game Amidst Uncertainty. And welcome particularly to our panelists today, Suyi Kim, the head of Asia-Pacific at the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board. She's based in Hong Kong. Um, we've got Jeffrey Jay, the Chief Investment Officer of the Government, of Government Investment Corporation of Singapore, also based in Singapore. And we've also got Hazem Ben Garchum, the Chief Executive Officer of InvestCorp. It's a global private markets investor. Technically, Hazem is based in London, but technically, but currently um, traveling and, and quarantining. So we're all kind of existing in this very different COVID world. Um, I'm Wendy Norris, the, def the Deputy Chief Investment Officer for Private Markets at Future Fund, which is Australia's sovereign wealth fund. And I'm pleased to be a moderator for the conversation today. And, and I'm based in Melbourne. So between the four of us, um, we all manage very large global institutional investment portfolios with a heavy emphasis on private markets. And we each have a different geographical kind of focus. Um, and we all are based in, in various places around the globe. So we have quite unique perspectives on the world. We've now had nine months since the major market reaction to the news of COVID-19, and that's time for the immediate portfolio crisis to pass and to give us the opportunity to reflect on what has been and on what may be to come. So today, we'll explore the key strategic investment decisions that our institutions are being faced with in the current uncertain environment. And so let's dive right in um, and let's start the conversation today by discussing whether this crisis was or in fact is different from an institutional investor perspective. And, and Jeffrey, let's start with you. Um, how has your worldview changed and how does GIC incorporate this worldview into its long term strategic investment decisions? Wendy, thanks very much, and uh, thank you for uh, the invitation by Milken to be on this panel with with friends and and you know whose firms uh, we know very well and whom we interact with a lot. Um, I think uh, there are two perspectives I'd like to give. I think uh, first an internal one, then an external one. I mean, as you know, investing is all about you know what you can do internally as well as as the external environment. And this crisis was an especially difficult one because internally, you know, um, everybody had to stop work. We we tested all our business continuity uh, capabilities and, and um, sort of finding uh, our teams uh, being in different continents, being, being at home and, and, and so on uh, was a real test. I think one of the great things uh, we found out was that um, um, it helped that we were already a, a global organization with many offices, um, you know, um, and, and um, being, being able to call on, on people in different uh, uh, locations um, it allowed us, I think, um, to, to also then touch, uh, touch our network, um, talk with our partners, um, talk with our companies live in, in the right uh, time zone. Um, and so, you know, offices like, like our London office, which has been open now for, for close to 30 years, in fact, we're, we're celebrating. Um, having all these touch points locally allowed us to, to continue um, you know, and keep a track of, of, of all our investments and in fact to do new ones. Uh, having an office in China meant that when China opened uh, actually relatively early on, uh, allowed us to, to go straight into, into continuing uh, to do deals and, and so on early. So, so that I think was, was a, a change in the world uh, that, that we, we uh, lived in and, and you know, happy that, that we, we were prepared for that. 
I think from an external environment point of view, what has really changed um, is that we think um, this crisis accentuated capabilities of certain countries, industries, and, and companies um, that look like um, they, they will continue. So those companies and countries that are that were prepared for a digital world um, have, have the human capital capable for, for it, have the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure, uh, were able to sort of uh, continue uh, in business and, and go from strength to strength. I think countries and companies that, that didn't have that actually found themselves disadvantaged and, and it's not clear that um, uh, we'll be able to catch up again very quickly. So I think um, that that is something that that you know um, is, a, is a change in worldview, and you know it, it sort of it doesn't even out the playing field. In fact, um, those those that are advantaged uh, will continue to be advantaged. Indeed, that's a very interesting perspective, and I think the importance of that global presence is is has really kind of come home um, in an environment where travel has become so difficult, um, which might be a good way, segue for for Hazem to get your kind of perspective on whether this is this time's the same, whether your worldview has changed and whether that's impacting your strategic investment decisions. Well, thank you, Andy. And again, thank you to the Milton Institute for inviting me. And I hope that everyone who's listening in is keeping very healthy and safe. First, you use the word crisis. And I'm not sure if we should refer to this as a crisis, pandemic or a catastrophe. Um, and if you look on the uh, on a human front, on the before even getting to investments, you know, just on the on the human, on the uh, personal front, on the health front, I mean, this is really has been a truly a synchronized global catastrophe. I don't think in our in history uh, there is any kind of a time frame where we can look at a particular catastrophic event that had a synchronized effect globally. Even in the two thousand and eight financial crisis, if you remember. Uh, whilst US, uh, North America and Europe have suffered the brunt of um, that kind of uh, impact, uh, Asia in large part have continued to operate quite okay from the 2008 you know, kind of period. The same thing with the Middle East. Kind of it was not, you don't have that much of an impact as you did, but this is probably the first impact is really kind of that synchronized impact of this crisis. The second one is the speed and pace of, um, of this particular crisis. If I just use one um, one statistics which I pulled last night, um, during the Great Depression, you know, which is about three and a half to four years, about 3.8 million, 8.6 million uh, Americans lost their job, okay? During the month of April alone in the U.S., 20 million lost their jobs. So just gives you a feeling of the severity of this crisis and the impact it does uh, on the world. Now, how would this change our view as a, as an investor in the private markets, first and foremost, I hope we'll always be calm and measured in our reaction to events and not necessarily kind of to go into any knee-jerk reactions uh, into certain actions. Um, you mentioned in the beginning, now we are about nine months into this, six to nine months. I'm not sure if the dust has settled yet. So a part of me says it's a bit too early, a bit too premature to start to make decisions one way or another by sector, by geography, by uh, asset class and what have you. Perhaps we give it another few months, maybe even half a year before until there is a bit of a settlement and we see what is the new, new world order which we're all living in. Two things very clear is the diversity and the impact. And I think Jeffrey referred to this, just the importance of diversity in your portfolio, either by asset class, by sector and by geography. And finally, crises and this is one of the positive things that crises usually kind of uh, come out of them is uh, they accelerate certain inevitable trends. And perhaps, you know, kind of this particular kind of a uh, pandemic crisis or catastrophe have really accelerated certain trends in terms of both consumer and corporate behaviors, uh, whether it's an e-commerce adoption, whether it's the concept of um, the working days. I mean, we keep forgetting that the five day a week working days that is a phenomenon that's only been with us for about 120, 140 years. Okay, this is not kind of has been the beginning. So perhaps there are certain changes in uh, consumer and corporate behaviors, which over time we will learn from. And as investors in those private markets, um, we'd have to keep our ears very close to the, to the ground and take, take toll from that. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. And I think 
a lot of that um, acceleration of trends and those permanent changes have been, um, I, I guess it's the way it always goes, you know, it's change happens slowly, 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 and then all at once. And we've certainly seen a lot of the all of once effects happen in, in what was a very kind of um, tumultuous period in markets for a very finite period of time. But as you say, Hazem, it's, there's, particularly in private markets, those waves take a long time to ripple out um, to impact our day-to-day our -day portfolio decisions. Um, I'd be quite interested in, in sticking with you, um, Hazem, to think about, to talk about whether there were liquidity challenges that impacted the way you thought about your investments during that period, because there's often a lot of, um, that's one of the things that concerns people with when they're large investors in illiquid assets, how does the liquidity impact um, affect your portfolio during, uh, during a difficult period? So, so um, uh, the 2008 financial crisis taught us one thing, that crisis equals liquidity crunch. That is not the case today. And I think the immediate reaction from all of us um, uh, investors in the private markets when the crisis hits is to draw, at least as far as the portfolio company is concerned, to draw on all the credit lines, you know, kind of pour as much liquidity as possible, just because we all have these case scenarios of the 2008 financial crisis and uh, the banking system struggled to keep up with the liquidity needs and all the cost effects are on the back of that. Um, there is one very big different circumstance today, which is the unprecedented fiscal uh, stimulus, which pretty much globally uh, all the governments have uh, put into the system. Um, uh, that uh, have really, really in a, in, a, in a very, you know, surreal way, you look at the performance of businesses, but then you look at the liquidity in the market and something doesn't uh, tie up. Uh, but I think that liquidity today in the market, um, um, and embarrassingly, if I can say, some of our portfolio companies have actually been issuing dividend recaps at this point in time, which is kind of just to think in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a crisis, and you're able to, and these are oversubscribed, significantly oversubscribed. So perhaps the environment we have today, uh, the liquidity, the, the combination of the low interest rates and the fiscal stimulus is, is, not, is, is effectively assisting uh, portfolio businesses and investors from a liquidity standpoint. However, it is really in a way a tale of two cities. Uh, there are certain uh, sectors who are a significant net beneficiary of these type of liquidity solutions and others are struggling. So in fairness, uh, for, for example, some of our US retail businesses have struggled heavily and lenders and others have shied away from providing uh, even the smallest of liquidity lines to these facilities. Absolutely. I'd be interested, Su Yi, in your perspectives on this. You've got a, a different perspective, a different geographic kind of focus for your portfolio and, um, and a, a more kind of outside of just private markets a broader kind of portfolio to think about. Um, how has the liquidity impact impacted you and the way CPPIB thinks about its portfolio? I think ov overall, uh, we do have, as Wendy, you mentioned, very diverse portfolio, but within that about half of our assets invested in private assets through private equity and real assets. Over this pandemic as well, I mean, we, these assets, I would say the overall kind of behave the way that we expected. expected. But as Hazim mentioned uh, just now, we have seen that liquidity uh, impacting much less so than last crisis, the global financial crisis. So we have seen that with the uh, central bank uh, stepping in, uh, the liquidity crunch only lasted uh, less than a week uh, in developed markets. IPO activities did not slow down, particularly this part of the world in Asia. Uh, there has been very active uh, IPO pipelines that allowed the private asset investors to take some liquidity uh, out of their uh, investments too. But having said that, what we have learned uh, as we build a very sizable private asset portfolio, we really focused on uh, liquidity planning. And I would say that that really worked out well for us this time as well. So what we have done is really conducting various scenario analysis under different market conditions and really closely monitoring our total fund uh, liquidity situation, including our pipelines and things. Um, as we expected, um, exits of the private investments did slow down and I think it's it may go on a bit longer, particularly for the uh, companies that's been hit harder through due to pandemic. 
Uh, we have seen some of the other cash flows, whether it's a dividend um, or whether it's a rental income that's coming out from the private assets are uh, slowed down or dried. So all of these things, investors really need to uh, plan and think ahead to make sure that you have enough liquidity. It's, and I think that's lesson that we learned through this as well. And so you, just to take that kind of one step further beyond just the liquidity planning elements of it, were there other lessons that you learned about the resilience of your portfolio to an unexpected shock? I mean, I guess we all do this kind of um, scenario planning or some version of it, uh, but this was, um, as, as Hazem mentioned, the coordination of, of this event across, you know, everything at once. Was, was there... Was there other aspects of resilience in your portfolio that responded in ways that you didn't expect? Were there, were there lessons learned from this crisis? Another lesson that we learned, I think JJ mentioned and Hazim mentioned briefly as well, diversification. That, that was so important. So we learned our diversification across asset classes, countries and currencies were very important. So for example, the fixed income equity behaved the way that we expected. So our fixed income exposure provided cushion when the equity and, and the credit sold off. Diversified currency exposure also helped. Uh, for example, US dollar appreciation against currencies, particularly Canadian dollar, which is our reporting currency, made a significant contribution to our last fiscal year and result uh, reporting, for example. Another point is that our rebalancing process worked really well. So we bought into the equity market when it dipped in March and April um, to keep our desired equity exposure as part of our normal process and benefited from the subsequent rallies in the equity market. And in addition to that, one last point is that we have very wide range of investment strategies that really helped us. So we have built a wide range of internal skills across many different active strategies across public and private that really uh, meaningfully increased our portfolio breadth and then risk adjusted returns over this time as well. Fantastic. Um, that's that's a great opportunity. I, I found that during the crisis period for us where the pace of, of all of the decision making went to kind of 10 times what it had been in a normal environment where we went from having holding our investment committee kind of every 10 days to holding it every day. It was, um, it was great to have the opportunity to see the way not only the whole team pulled together during a really kind of um, intense period, but the way that you see how that diversification um, works in practice, it was um, uh, certainly a very interesting period in, our, in all of our lives, I suspect. And, and Jeffrey, I'd be very interested to hear your perspective also on, on, you know, whether there were lessons learned about the resilience of the portfolio to unexpected shocks or, or whether it was all just part of what you'd expected in, in the planning. Yeah, I wish we were so smart in planning as to be able to uh, anticipate this. But but I think the planning point is a is a good one. I mean, um, one of the things that um, we had worried about um, coming into to 2020 was that you know it's been a bit, it had been a very long expansion, and and you know we were worried that that you know the expansion would would come to an end, and therefore we were already trying to tilt our portfolios towards more resilient um, types of sectors, you know, less cyclical ones. And, and certainly, it, you know, it was a test of, of, uh, of that. Um, and, and we were trying to build systems that could allow us to understand, um, you know, our portfolio companies and how they were doing. And, and, and so when, when the crisis hit in the first few weeks, you know, we were trying to gather information to, to try to understand whether our portfolio uh, companies were performing as expected or were as resilient as, as we hope, um, certainly having those things in place, you know, that preparation was, was quite important. Um, but I think in, in the end, um, not only um, did the monetary authorities come in with liquidity injections that helped um, um, the markets, uh, particularly the, the, the publicly traded stuff to bounce back very quickly as, as Hazim was, was saying, um, but also importantly, the fiscal authorities came in so quickly with the kind of support that normally you wouldn't see uh, even in a recession. So uh, job, job support schemes that, that helped uh, to pay companies to keep uh, folks employed, um, you know, uh, uh, additional unemployment compensation. And so I think it allowed uh, many cyclical sectors to remain more resilient than you would have thought. 
So in fact, if you were, if you were in, in, in a goods uh, producing or goods selling uh, type of uh, industry, um, there was virtually no, no shortfall. Consumer staples actually saw sales you know, at 120% of normal and, and even consumer discretionary. Um, you know, if you weren't running a retail store, um, you know, you, you, uh, but instead supplying into e-commerce and so on, you did very well. So I think it's been an, an unexpected um, uh, crisis in that way. The, the fiscal response actually meant that, that you know, the, the resilience of the portfolio didn't, didn't get tested in the way that we thought uh, it would need to be. That's great. Yeah, it's interesting the those countervailing effects and how they opposed each other. And at, as a, if you take it kind of all together, taken as a whole, um, it feels like the the response, the policy response, has largely offset the the immediate kind of impact of the the, the economic shutdowns. Um, and so we've been in this relatively unprecedented period where. Um, it felt like the governments learned from the last major financial crisis that they needed to respond quickly and they, they did respond quickly and, and to a very large extent and taken as a whole, you know, it's definitely benefited our portfolios overall. But if you peel the layer back just one more kind of level, and you guys have already touched on this, um, people talk about this K-shaped recovery where, and, and I think, Jeffrey, you spoke earlier about the, the people that were digital, digitally enabled have have you know been able to to forge forward. There's been a bit of liquidity support supporting some of the companies, but then there's other parts of of our portfolios and of the of the global economies that have suffered quite badly. Um, have you, Jeffrey? I'll stick with you for a moment. Do you have any observations about how it's playing out in your portfolio from that kind of K shaped recovery? Some people are benefiting, some people are not. And and do you think that's going to be able to be sustained? Uh, yeah. No, I, th I think unfortunately, um, uh, so the, there's good and the good news and bad news. So the 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 bad news is that um, um, you know all of the the good stuff's well priced in. You know, so if, if, even if if you know good good companies, good good industries can continue, I mean, we've priced that in. We we know that that you know it, it is the case, and and the trading at you know thirty times EV, but uh, whatever. So. Um, so that's the, um, the, you know, that's one, one angle of it. The other angle is that um, with vaccines coming in um, and with all the monetary and fiscal support, you know, we should get a normal type of uh, recovery from, from, you know, this, this cessation of activity um, in 2021. And if that's the case, and there are sectors that are cyclical that should recover that, that haven't uh, really been been pricing that recovery in, and and I think there are opportunities for us as investors to take a look at those and 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 decide whether or not um, you know these these are, are are worth investing in. So I think that's um, that's a good consequence of that. Um, but I think the the other thing though is that in in the quick uh, recovery and the support that that you know many industries and 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 many households have been getting, um, it does mean that if you are if you're in a sector that really, you know, um, wasn't very good, or you're a company that um, is financially not very strong, um, you've been supported all this while, but but you haven't felt um, the the kind of the pressure to um, to change and and to evolve, um, and and so I think this concern around zombie companies and and whether you know all this uh, liquidity support allows companies um, to, to not adjust in the way that they, they need to adjust for, for, for the future um, is a live one. And it, it extends even to, to whole economies that if, if certain types of jobs um, are being supported today because of government um, schemes, um, they have to transition eventually to reskilling for, for the jobs that are gonna be created for the future types of industries. And, and um, you know, um, and, and if you will support could delay that that transition of reskilling and so on so i think there's there's still a lot of work uh, uh, to do you know within companies and then within industries uh, to prepare for this uh, long-term future 
Yeah, I, I think that that's very insightful. And and I think, Hazem, you may have even more granular insights into that, given that you're, you focus um, primarily on private equity. So you'll be a bit closer to the coalface. And, and you, I think you've got kind of a range of kind of high quality to probably higher growth type exposures in your portfolio. And you might have seen quite diverse outcomes so far and have views on what's next. Yeah, correct, correct, Wendy. Before I say, let me say, you mentioned the K-shaped recovery. Uh, I'm amazed by the use of the alphabets because I think when we started <laughs> V-shaped and then we went from a V-shaped to a W-shaped and then now a K-shaped, I wonder what yeah. alphabet we're going to use in the new year. I personally yeah. prefer Arabic letters, which have a lot of circles, <laughs> uh, which look a bit more like a roller coaster because it does feel more of a roller coaster ride, really, uh, than anything else. Because I wake up in the morning. And there is a news, you know, a big retailer is in administration, 14,000 jobs could be lost, but not to worry, wait until the afternoon and the US stock markets will be all time high and suddenly it's great all over again. So um, it is a bit ironic how we are living highs and lows on a daily basis. And that's kind of that roller coaster shape. So is it going to be a K-shaped? Uh, by the way, for full disclosure, it took me some time to figure out what does this K-shaped thing actually mean? You know, kind of too many arrows. Um, uh, but but I think what is very clear is um, uh, there is a clear bifurcation in the markets and by sectors and industries. Uh, is that a knee-jerk reaction, a, a short-term knee-jerk reaction today? I don't know. And I think it will be very difficult for anyone to have a clear um, a clear view on that. What is very clear is there are certain, as I was mentioning earlier, accelerated macro trends. Those will happen. Okay. And I really hope also, in addition to what uh, Jeffrey said about the vaccine, and hopefully that brings some kind of uh, calm and um, normality in the world. Also, the, 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 uh, the results of the US presidential elections, hopefully that will have really caused a reduction in the trade friction on a global basis and bring the world a little bit back together. Crises are usually good to bring people together. And I hope if there is one silver lining out of this catastrophe is on a global basis, we do come back uh, together. Um, one area I want to touch on is real estate, another area which we are quite uh, active in. Um, whilst on the private equity side, you can very clearly point to, you know what, Asia is looking great. I want to allocate more to Asia. Within Asia, subsectors such as healthcare, technology, uh, perhaps certain consumer consumption, what have you, are doing quite well. So that is a relatively um, safer bet at this point in the cycle. Uh, however, on the real estate front, um, uh, we feel it's a little bit too early to tell the impact, particularly on things like commercial properties and uh, multifamily homes. Um, now, what is perhaps the silver lining on the real estate front as well is the interest rate environment and perhaps that migration, the aggressive migration of e-commerce and the impact that's happening on the industrial uh, type of portfolios. So there are a lot of moving pieces. Um, as an investor, I find it exciting, but by the same token, you know, kind of you sit there and you scratch your head because literally things could go 180 degrees either way. And that's why I come back to the initial point is to be calm and measured into assessing and understanding uh, the realities and not get too distracted by the noise of, you know, oh my God, the tech sector is doing so well, we have to go heavy tech, or we have to just kind of, uh, um, the beauty of investing in the private markets is, um, it is not about what's your mark to mark at the end of the month. You're really playing the long game. You're looking at fundamentally creating value in businesses over a four to seven year period. And sometimes, you know, kind of that may take twists and turns, which no one expects, but it's okay. That's, that's the part of, you know, as investors, hopefully what we generate and deliver to our investors. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And especially to bring it back to the theme, which is about investing amidst uncertain times and, and taking that really long view. And I think that is one of the strengths that private markets can bring to our portfolios. Um, Suyi, I'd love to get your perspective on, on, um, on this as well, um, both geographically as well as just you know sectorally, are you seeing big divergences in your portfolios? What, how is it playing out in the real world for you? Yeah, I, I mean, over this pandemic in particular, as we discussed actually right uh, right before this um, uh, call, that many of Asian countries have successfully, more successfully handled this pandemic, right? Uh, and then the economic recoveries began much sooner and have been stronger than the US and Europe, 
and China is expected to be the only economy this year to generate positive growth rate with about 2% uh, expected this year. And developed economies in Asia as well, like Japan, South Korea, Singapore, where both speakers are currently at, and Australia, where you are, uh, one day, have experienced their own waves of pandemic, but have emerged stronger with contained lockdown measures, and which led to you know, mostly positive growth in the third quarter of this year. We have um, about 30% of our total fund invested in Asia Pacific, and that has actually served us uh, well, and our strategy is to continue to increase that. So we're gonna see uh, more investments, we're gonna do more investments in Asia Pacific. And we also think that emerging markets, uh, particularly Asian emerging markets, will continue to drive the growth of the global economy in post-COVID world. And our economic forecast team expects the recoveries of, there are more shapes that we're talking about, check mark, if this is not <laughs> alphabetical shape. Uh, and the emerging markets, uh, we think that's gonna follow more of a V shape, so faster recovery. And we have actually long-term strategy that we announced back in 2018 of CPP IB 2025. And there we, may, we said that we're gonna invest up to one third of our fund in uh, emerging markets. And that we plan to continue to focus on this um, long-term strategy. That's great. Um, Hazim, did you have anything else that you wanted to, um, to think, to kind of add on that geographic kind of um, divergences as well? Maybe uh, first I fully echo what Siri said around China and Asia in general. Just a few observations on North America and Europe where we are today about 86% um, of our total equity exposure is in, uh, in the West. Um, uh, the U.S., if I look at our portfolio, the U.S. is actually having quite a healthy recovery across the board, across different sectors and what have you, which, uh, and that's one of the beauty of the, the North American market, the U.S. market, it's just, it's just, it's sheer ability to bounce back. And no other market globally has that ability to bounce back and realign itself uh, across sectors and across fiscal policies and what have you, as, as the U.S. does. And that is what makes it one of the more attractive markets globally. Um, Europe, on the other hand, it is very sector specific. I mean, the, um, the irony is uh, uh, nine months ago, all you hear about in Europe is Brexit, 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 and the impact Brexit is having and what have you. And now it is so down <laughs> kind of the pecking order of importance, but it is still a very, very important issue uh, for the EU and for the UK. Um, a number of other very important issues, the, the German elections coming up in, in about 12 months time um, and the direction Germany will take. These are two anchor economies um, in, in Europe and their health, their both uh, political stability and financial health is an anchor part of how Europe will develop. So, so Europe, it's, um, uh, it's a bit of a wait and see. Uh, there are some question marks. Um, uh, some of the challenges, both the uh, government challenges in France and Italy kind of Kind of giving a bit of discomfort so i think you know to add to um in terms of if we look at the whole global picture uh perhaps the us will continue to maintain a relatively healthy momentum uh with europe we might need to be a bit more sector specific and target specific niche areas within that as opposed to a broader macro play fantastic and maybe that reference to, to macro plays is a good segue to, to talk about the kind of very big macro pressure that we, we all feel is probably building. And, and so you might, I might turn to you again to, to talk about the whole um, juxtaposition, which is a term we've been using between the, the kind of in the lower for longer expectation that macro markets have given all of the stimulus that's been put into the economies to the very low rates at which um, interest rates are being held globally um, versus the increasing inflationary pressures that theoretically must be building on the horizon as a long-term asset um, allocator. Um, we've really got to be able to take a view on how we navigate this kind of lower for longer versus inflation on the horizon. How does CPP try and incorporate that into their thinking about their portfolio construction? Yeah, I mean, there's a debate about inflation and then when that may happen. Um, our internal view is that inflation is unlikely in the near future, but it's much harder to see what's going to happen uh, down the road in two to three years after. 
that has a lot of implication for um, some implication for our um, different asset classes, for example, real assets. Um, and during this pandemic, one of the lessons we've been talking about, the lessons that we learned is the private real estate as well as infrastructure assets have more equity-like risks than we, uh, we thought before. So for example, I mentioned that rental income for many real estate investments um, got frozen uh, because of the rent holidays and toll roads, we own a lot of toll roads, uh, fee collections were suspended or slowed down. So we're thinking going forward, we may focus more on the business model risks for these uh, real assets than you know, what we thought before that these are just delivering very stable cash flow with high component of fixed income characteristics. And besides the real estate, um, as you mentioned, with the potential uh, inflationary concerns, investors are facing a world of high bond prices, high valuations for technology and good companies. If the capital is cheap and plentiful, uh, that will drive multiples and valuations higher for across all the asset classes. So what we try to do internally is that we try to employ a few toolkits uh, that, that may help us uh, to, um, to go through and manage inflationary pressures. For example, uh, we have a higher allocation to equity. Uh, we currently run our portfolio with 85-15 equity versus debt risk profile. And the second thing we also diversify, I mentioned across asset classes, and then we can move between uh, even same asset classes between private and public investments to, to find the best opportunities that's uh, available and across the countries and regions. Um, including, I mentioned, you know, more uh, investment into Asia and emerging markets going forward. Lastly, uh, we use our triple A credit rating uh, for our own entity to lever up our portfolio at the top of the house to provide that additional boost to our return. That's great. It's great to have all those um, levers to pull and the, and the insight to be able to, to know when to pull them. Um, so, um, Jeffrey, I'd be really interested in your perspective as well on this kind of question about um, the interest rate outlook, the lower for longer versus in inflation pressures, and does that change your appetite for, for real assets or, or any other asset class, and, and how do you reflect that in your portfolio thinking? Yeah, I think, um, you, you know, the... As mentioned earlier, you know that, that with so much stimulus in in the pipeline, you know, with consumers having already been given you know lots of uh, replacement income and uh, which they've saved, you know that there's uh, if you will a lot of pent up demand, and you know you can see that in the monetary aggregates which are growing at uh, unprecedented rates, you know M2 and and so on. Um, so I think I think there is uh, incipient um, kind of uh, inflationary pressures which. Uh, are not seen yet and nobody expects it and everybody sort of says well you know you've got so much unemployment you know why why should you see any inflation but but uh, definitely you have you have the ingredients for reflation uh, and so um, you know you have to ask well in that kind of environment um, is uh, fixed income uh, really giving you enough uh, recompense for for that that kind of risk there and 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 I think the answer is you know but too little Right, and and so you, you you have to ask, well, what 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 can I replace it with? What what gives me a better income um, than 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 fixed income? You know, given given that the the, the risk of reflation and inflation um, has gone up. Um, but every time we think about what what we could replace in terms of of you know high income, you know, from real assets and so on, um, we're also asking ourselves, well, what what is the other type of risk that we're taking on when we buy these assets that um, that you know we, we've maybe not thought through as, as carefully, and you know as Suyi mentioned, you know some of them turn out to be much more cyclical and, and potentially impacted by demand than than you think. I think in, in infrastructure, there's also a regulatory risk um, at a point in time when when you know sort of uh, um, you know consumers are, are are in a in a poor place. You know the the regulatory uh, incentive to to err on the side of the consumer rather than the asset owner is is great. So I think um, you know when we think about real assets, you know, yes, they they, they look much more attractive, you know, from a from a yield point of view. Um, but trying to to put together a portfolio where the other risks that you take on are well diversified and 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 so on is quite important, also. That's great. 
Well, I think we're almost out of time for our discussion today. So I'd really like to thank you all very much for the engaging, um, the engaging topics that you were able to, to share your views on. Um, I think you've really helped our audience gain some insight into how the long game is played and how to hold the course with your investment strategy, even in the midst of an uncertain environment. Su Yi, I'd particularly like to thank you so much for your perspective on diversification in practice and your illustration of how important it is to really understand what drives your portfolio and the returns that it, that it delivers and how we can't just think the same way as we thought about it before. Um, so thank you very much. Um, Hazem, it really resonated with me when you spoke about being calm and measured. And I think that is one of the true values of, of holding you know, a strong allocation to private markets. Um, whilst there's all this noise going on around you, if you can just hold that course, um, that is another great example of how you play that long game. And Jeffrey, the thing that I really found um, engaging in, in your perspective was what you started with, that, that importance of rising to the challenge and that those that were prepared for a digital world will be able to succeed and thrive in the environment going forward. So thank you again, all of you, for your great um, engagement and participation. I really enjoyed the conversation and um, best, best wishes with um, moving into the end of year and, and who knows what uh, 2021 will bring us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot.